Hey folks, I'm Carter McNish from the IKS, and I am on site on the battlefield of Rice's Crossroads. We're on June 10th, 1864. 3,500 Confederate cavalry faced off against about 7,800 Union infantry, cavalry, and artillery. It was an interesting battle, not just because of the numbers disparity, but also because of the disparity in terms of the quality and also of the type of troops. The Union 7,800 force had a, an eclectic mix of forces. It had 22 cannons, uh, a mixture of 6-pounders, 12-pounders, uh, and some more modern rifled artillery as well. Uh, they had about a division of cavalry, two brigades worth, about half of their force was cavalry, and they had a division of infantry, two brigades, uh, ad hoc, put together, uh, plus a regiment of United States colored troops, um, the freed slaves, uh, free blacks from up north, uh, who came to fight for the Union. And so it was this eclectic mix of Union forces versus a Confederate force of 3,500 cavalrymen exclusively. Uh, there was a regiment of Kentuckians, or I think a couple regiments of Kentuckians from that force who were mounted but had been infantry up until just a few months before. So Confederate cavalry and mounted infantry force under the command of a guy by the name of Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so you've got these two very different armies. The Confederates have these mounted infantry plus another 2,500 or so cavalry. Uh, they've got, and they've got uh, 11 guns to the Union's 22. Uh, and so definitely a numbers disparity here, as well as an equipment disparity. The Confederates, one of those batteries, uh, one of those batteries of the two, had four of the more modern rifled ordnance uh, or ordnance rifles, um, and so those were some of the best artillery on the battlefield. The best gun on the battlefield, the other Confederate battery, on top of its just normal, regular artillery guns, nothing special, they had a Whitworth rifle uh, from the UK, and that was one of the best artillery pieces of the period, uh, let alone in the Civil War. So that Whitworth rifle, under the command of a very capable officer, would play a key role in the battle here. So. In terms of our Civil War engagements, pretty small. It's not your Gettysburg, it's not your Antietam. You don't have 100,000 men facing 60 or 70,000 men like you see out east. This is a small engagement. Most, the forces gathered here would have comprised an entire corps in most other of the engagements that you're going to study. So what I think is interesting here, though, is not necessarily the size, not necessarily the massive tactics employed, right? Not these grand sweeping movements. I think what's really interesting is the philosophies of command of the two different sides. As I mentioned earlier, the Confederate force is commanded by a guy named Nathan Bedford Forrest, famous later for founding the Ku Klux Klan. We won't talk about that in depth here, uh, but that's another piece of trivia from his life. He, in the beginning of the war, personally armed equipped, supplied, and organized a, a, an entire regiment of cavalry. I mean, he was that rich. Um, and he had enough sway with the public to actually find enough people to go and join his own regiment. He was there at Fort Donelson when Grant captured that. And he fought in every campaign out west, basically throughout the entire war. His most recent experience up until this point was with the... Army of the Tennessee out near Chattanooga uh, fighting in the Battle of Chickamauga and in the whole Chattanooga campaign. And just before this, uh, in May of 1864, General Johnston had ordered Forrest to move west, not with his original cavalry corps, but with only a force of about 250 men. And he was sent out here to northern Mississippi, northern Alabama, to raise a force from scratch using that 250-man complement as the basis of his command. And so the army that he's fighting with here today is not only this eclectic mix of cavalry, mounted, cav mounted infantry, and artillery. It is pretty much entirely fresh. He actually went on raids up into Tennessee and Kentucky to actually go and recruit these men into his force. So this cavalry command of his is actually pretty brand new to combat. There's some veterans. There's plenty but it's a mix of veterans and completely green troops. So, meanwhile, you've got a Union force, nearly 8,000 men, coming out of Memphis. 
and I'll just say it out. I'll just say it outright. The union should have won this. They didn't. The the union had of all their units only a couple regiments were actually green. Uh, a couple Illinois regiments had never fought before, but the entire rest of the command structure, uh, all of the rest of the troops had seen combat before, except for the United States colored troops, but they had, there's a little bit of context to this, Fort Pillow in this general neighborhood as well, there was a battle there. You don't need to know what happened except for the fact that a bunch of U.S. colored troops there uh, broke and ran. It was a humiliation for that part of the service. And so these troops had actually sworn an oath to their commanding officer that they would take no quarter and that they would give none. And what, is that, what that essentially means is that they're committed to the death, right? They want to avenge the insult that was the Battle of Fort Pillow. And so even though they haven't gotten any combat experience, they are very keen troops. So even the least experienced of these Union troops are keen, right? And that's, that's half of the battle, right, is you want to have your army want to be there, ideally. And so pretty much if you're stacking the numbers, you're stacking the uh, modifiers, so to speak, right? You're looking at the Confederate army. It's not even really an army. It's basically a brigade. Green troops, led by a good commander, Nathan Bedford Forrest is no joke, uh, but it's green troops. They are equipped with seven different types of guns, uh, each one with a different caliber of ammo. Uh, and, and then they're just trying to gather supplies that they can. It's this hodgepodge effort. Um, then you look at the Union with standard issue troops, right? You know, all very well equipped. Uh, there's more of them. Two or three to one odds here, right? And then you've got, I mean, the, the advantages just keep going. General Sturgis, who's in charge of the Union force, experienced cavalry commander. Uh, he was at the Battle of Wilson's Creek out in Arkansas with General Nathaniel Lyon. Uh, that was a staggering Union victory. A small Union force ambushed and destroyed nearly a larger Confederate force. Um, so kind of a similar situation to Bryce's Crossroads, ironically. Um, he was he was with Grant, he was with Sherman. He fought at the Battle of Fredericksburg out east. Uh, he made his fame as the commander of the cavalry of the Army of Ohio. He was put in charge of this force of Union troops at the personal recommendation of William T. Sherman. So, no joke. But, as we'll see, his leadership wasn't quite there for this battle. And then all of his subordinates, I mean, I won't go through each of them, but same kind of resume, right? All experienced commanders of their own right, good combat experience, great leaders, well-connected, right? Everybody is top-notch in this Union force. And yet, today, or, well, not today, but that day, June 10, 1864, would be the downfall of most of them. Just a uh, unique circumstance here. So let's get into the context of why this battle is happening, right? Let, we're doing some operational games. Uh, let's talk about the operational context here. Why does this battle matter? Well, in 1864, General William Tecumseh Sherman was moving his army down towards Atlanta. In order to supply that army, he had one railroad connection, a single line railroad, not double track, single track, all the way from Louisville, Kentucky, to Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then following him down to Atlanta. A single railroad line. Now, he managed to get the most out of that railroad line. When he took over command, that line was getting about 60 railroad cars down from Nashville to Chattanooga a day. First, he got it up to like 120, and then I believe the record that he got before the campaign was 196 cars a day coming down that line. And just imagine, that line is going to be packed full of trains. And so, this wouldn't necessarily be a problem if it wasn't for Nathan Bedford Forrest. Because Sherman had a very high opinion of Forrest. 
And when he heard that Forrest, even with only 250 men, had been sent out here to Stephen D. Lee's Department of the Mississippi, he knew that he was going to be problem. He was going to be troublemaker. He was going to do everything he could to ruin Sherman supply lines by raiding, uh, guerrilla warfare. That was something that Nathan Bedford Forrest was, Forrest was pretty well known for. And so when Sherman heard that Forrest was out here raising another army, even though he knew that his strength estimates were only going to be around 3,000 men, even though he knew that these guys were completely green, he had a high enough appreciation for Nathan Bedford Forrest's command talent that he would send this force of 10,000 men explicitly with orders to kill or capture Forrest. Not just to destroy the force, but to kill or capture Nathan Bedford Forrest the man. So that's the context. He's worried that Nathan Bedford Forrest is going to go up and cut his supply line through, the, through that railroad right up into Tennessee. And in fact, he is correct, because Forrest, once he raises his three, 4,000-man force, he immediately petitions Stephen D. Lee to take it and go cut the railroad line. And he's finally given permission to take about 2,500 men and six guns up to cut the railroad line. He marches north through Alabama, gets to the Tennessee River, when he receives word that a Union force of 10,000 men is marching into North Mississippi. It's Sturgis's division. It's basically a division. It's, um, it's four brigades. So even though it's an expeditionary force, is what they called it, and it's technically comprised of two divisions, it's a division, really. And so he has to turn around, gather up what men he can, and head out to go engage. And Stephen D. Lee, he's in charge of the whole department, right? So he's, the, he's technically the guy who's in overall command. And he tells Forrest to basically screen and slow down the Union troops and engage if he has an advantage. And so Forrest takes his orders and exceeds them. He says, you know what? I think this Union column is a, bit, is a bit stringed out. In fact, it was. I'm going to try and attack it and drive it back. And so on the morning of June 10th, 1864, we have Nathan Bedford Forrest's column coming down that road from that direction and Samuel Sturgis's army, the lead elements of which, some cavalry, were encamped about a half mile behind the camera at a place called Bryce's Crossroads. The crossroads of roads. You know, that's how crossroads work. <coughs> An interesting point of geography. I'll turn the camera. There's a monument over there. The monument marks the spot where four different counties of Mississippi meet together. So I'm technically, or well, we are technically standing on the dividing line between two counties at the moment, and there's two more on the other side of that monument. Anyhow, Nathan Bedford Forest, coming down this direction, and about a half mile that way, just beyond those trees and just over that hill, his lead element, a scouting element, about 700 men, encounters the lead force of Union cavalry, about... 1,500 men. <coughs> Union cavalry, commanded again by an experienced officer, they all deploy, right, dismount, get into battle formations, move forward, same thing with the Confederates, and they start firing at each other. Now you'll notice this terrain is very heavily wooded, and I'm filming this on July 1, and you can see that the trees are in full bloom. Everything's green. Heck, I'll, I'll give you a pan, right? If you go beyond these trees into the woods, it's basically jungle. A lot of thick brush, ugly stuff going on. Not a great time. And so all that is to say that these commanders, unless they're operating in one of these few open fields, they're not seeing very much. Let me... I'm going to adjust the camera here. <laughs> You're a little crooked. Okay. All right. I'm doing this in one take, so you're going to have to bear with me. So, we've got some fighting. And just like here, right, it's pretty much in a clearing a bit smaller than this one, just down the road. I, I swear I was just there 
it's like, you don't have to see it in order to believe me, right? It's just a little smaller than this one. And so the ends of each line, even though the Confederate line is shorter than the Union line, they're all in the woods and the tangled mess out there. And so the commanders <coughs> can't see the end of their lines. The Confederate commander knows he's outnumbered because he's getting reports from his troops on either end that they're being enveloped. The Union commander doesn't know. He's, he's not quite sure. He can't see either end of his line. And at any rate, the Confederate troops in front of him are pouring this devastating fire into his men. It is a, it is a sharp, hot fight. And so the Union commander, for all he knows, is outnumbered two or three to one, just with the volume of fire he's seeing, with the reports of stuff going wrong all down his line. And so he decides, perhaps rightly, to start withdrawing. And so messages are going back and forth. Union runners coming back, or actually riders coming back from there, passing through here, getting to Brace's Crossroads saying, guys, we're in a big fight. We need help. You're getting crooked again. <laughs> I apologize. So, Union runners, you're just going to have to deal with the crookedness. Union runners, riders, getting back, alerting General Sturgis, and all sorts of Union units are moving up here. The Confederate column, which woke up about an hour and a half earlier that morning than the Union, they woke up at 0400. Union, their reveille was at 0500. Sorry, 0530. And the infantry's marching orders was to start marching at 0700. So, to he who wakes up first goes the battle. That's an idiom that you might use from this. Um, so the Confederates are way ahead. They are starting to marshal more forces. Nathan Bedford Forrest, with his personal command party, actually arrives only a few minutes after the shooting starts and starts directing his units as they arrive which side of the line they go to. And so, only an hour after the fight, units are starting to arrive. Forrest is saying, okay, you guys, go to the right flank. You guys, go to the left flank. And is slowly extending his line to the point where now the Union Brigade commander up there is actually right to think that he's outnumbered. Because he actually is now. And so, his forces start falling back. And they're pressed back through those woods and through this field. And this is about where Union infantry starts getting involved. Uh, the Union commander, Sturgis, has gotten his infantry division up. They're crossing this creek over here, and, and they're starting to form into the line. And meanwhile now, Nathan Bedford Forrest has got all of his cavalry out. They're all deployed in the line. And there's a couple units, just one regiment or two, that have actually just arrived on the field. And so Forrest sends one of these regiments round the right, all the way to the extreme right flank of the line. And the other one, about 250 cavalrymen, just one regiment, it's not really a regiment, it's a couple companies, really. They get there, and Forrest, with his personal detachment, gives them to that regiment commander and orders them around the left flank. And so Forrest knows something about military psychology. You see, only the most battle-hardened troops will hear firing to their rear and not run. He knows this. He knows that even if he sends 500 men around behind, just 500 men, that if they start creating havoc, stirring up a ruckus, starting to shoot, all they, the men on the Union line are going to hear that behind them, flip their gizzard, and start running. And so, all of a sudden, that flanking force goes out. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Forrest actually says, Go on to the end! And they say that uh, on all the signs, uh, it's E dash E dash E and D, you know, and with the southern drawl. And so the Confederate cavalry gets around behind and starts attacking the Union supply columns, which are actually facing away from the road, so they have to turn around in order to escape. And then, and then all hell breaks loose. That, that's what happens. The Union. Without orders, clearly, start breaking and running. They think they're outnumbered by just extreme odds. General Sturgis 
he forms up artillery on the hill behind you. I'll turn around because we're battles going that way. So let me turn you all around. So General Sturgis, he orders Union artillery batteries, about 16 guns, form up on that hill over yonder and start firing into over the top of the heads of the Union infantrymen, which are forming a new line. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Let me adjust the camera here a little bit. <clears throat> Again, one take, you gotta bear with me. If you can see the road back there, that's about the spot where those cars are parked. New Union lines forming. Forrest's cavalry, again, dismounted with their guns, pushing up through this field. And they're attacking, keeping up the pressure. Union artillery firing over the heads of their infantry counterparts and dismounted cavalry to engage the Confederate troops. And it's at this point where Forrest does something interesting. Remember that Whitworth rifle? Remember those three inch ordnance rifles that I was telling you about? Those 11 guns are wheeled up, not to this ridge here. This is the next big ridge before that next Union line. They were up here putting down some, putting down some hate on those Union troops, and they were doing pretty good. But Forrest knows that with now that he's outnumbered and still keeping the attack going, he needs something to break the Union morale, to actually just finish them off. And so what he ends up doing is he takes those cannons rolls them up to within 60 yards of the Union front line. Uh, I'm trying to think of where a good geographic feature is. That tree there, just in the middle, about where those cannons start firing double loaded canister straight down the mouth of these Union troops. And that, well that, ladies and gentlemen, is the final straw. That combined with the, remember that force of cavalry, Forrest sent around the end of the line to go cut off the right flank of the, or well, the left flank of the Union Army, right flank of the Confederates. They're starting to crash down now, and the only bridge across a creek, which is back there, is on the extreme left of the Union line. And so those cavalrymen capture the bridge. So all of a sudden, the Union are now up creek without a paddle, so to speak. They have no bridge, and so they're either going to have to swim or surrender. And at that point, that's when things start getting desperate. At this point, General Sturgis has no control over his men, and they start running. Many of them for the bridge, trying to make a break for it. Some people get across, some guns escape, but it's ugly. A bunch of men just drop their guns and start swimming across that creek. Forrest, he chases them are right down to the creek, captures a bunch of them, but it doesn't stop there. For the next two days, that Union column is gonna run all the way back to Memphis. And for the next two days, Forrest Cavalry is gonna chase them, harass them, capture them, kill them, as best as they can, all the way until they get under the guns of the defenses of Memphis. In the end, the final recounting is about 250 Union men killed, another 350, 400 wounded, and around 1,600 missing. It's about 25% losses. That's devastating. Confederates, meanwhile, I believe the number is 96 killed, about 200, 250 wounded, and no missing. So, pretty one-sided victory, that's for sure. Now let's, for our sake of our Kriegspiel, let's, let's think about this for a minute. This whole battle was a mind game. Forrest took advantage of some local conditions, namely the trees, to conceal his true, tra true strength and to basically bluffed the Union into thinking he was bigger than he was. The Union Cavalry Commander in charge of that brigade that got ambushed there, not ambushed, but encountered, the first encounter of the battle, to his dying day thought that he was outnumbered at least three to one. 
and the Union Army commanders, all of them thought they were numbered, outnumbered by about the same amount of men. Even though, in fact, the numbers ratio was the opposite. There was a certain, there was a certain element of boldness to it, right? Forrest attacked, and he kept attacking, and he didn't stop attacking until the Union just broke and, re broke and ran. And even then, he kept attacking until it was obvious that the Union were now under the guns of Memphis and were, his force would get slaughtered if they kept pursuing. So that's one thing. Another thing, Forrest was right up there in, in the fight. Not necessarily actually shooting his pistol, doing other things, but he was at the point of contact, and he was able to, as the commander shift his forces however he needed in order to take advantage of local changes in the situation. General Sturgis, trying to get his spread out column organized and sent to the front, was never near the front line. And so he never actually saw what was going on until it was too late. Forrest, he also had just some knowledge of human psychology, right? He knew that if you started raising hell behind the enemy line, that most of these soldiers would break and run. If the Union had tried something similar, and they very well could have, Forrest's men, being green as they were, probably would have ran too. And so, in the end, this is a classic case of a bluff, right? The Union had no clue that they were actually the superior force. But Forrest, through his aggressiveness, and by taking advantage of local situation, right, uh, the Union not being quite prepared for a battle, the Union not seeing the full extent of his force, and then just doing everything he could to keep the Union off balance, meant that Sturgis couldn't respond to anything before something else came up. And so he was working on the last problem, he was working on the second best problem instead of the new one, right? So he, you know, he was working on one problem as another problem was developing, which he could have solved. The problem he was working on, already pretty much useless, it's already already screwed. And so then he should have switched to that one, right? But then a new problem, and a new problem, and a new problem, and a new problem, and it just kept on going like that. I think the uh, Air Force, or the military calls that the OODA loop, right? The, the uh, whole cycle between learning about a problem, figuring out a solution, and executing it. Forrest was just creating new problems before Sturgis could get through that loop. And so, uh, just a completely outplayed, right? Um, and it, I'm not sure if Bryce's Crossroads would make a good creek spiel, maybe something like it, um, just because you can't exactly pull off what Forrest did, you know, every time, right? This is the case, this is the kind of case of a battle where the Union should have won this battle nine times out of ten. But that tenth time was this time, right? And so it, it was just, you know, a really, really skillful handling of Forrest's troops that won the day. And so I might even put this battle to the credit of Nathan Bedford, Nathan Bedford Forrest less than to the discredit of Sturgis. Um, Sturgis, right, we were just talking about that, he was... A skilled commander had taken many victories, right? He was he was personally recommended by Sherman, and Sherman was no dupe. He wasn't going to recommend a guy who he thought had good connections. He was going to recommend a guy who he thought could get the job done. But Forrest just had him beat. And so, there you have it. There's some Kriegspiel lessons from the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads. And uh, feel free to talk with me more about it. Might run a Kriegspiel of a similar situation to this. Of course, I wouldn't tell the players that if I did. But uh, that's pretty much everything I got to say to you today. So, hope you enjoyed. Feel free to watch other videos on the IKS YouTube channel. Just a couple days, I'm going to be going down to uh, Champion Hill, Big Black River Bridge, Vicksburg, uh, Port Gibson. All those battles from Grant's Vicksburg campaign. I'm going to do some similar videos analyzing some, quote, Kriegspiel moments from those battles. And uh, I hope to see you watching those. Anyhow, 
If you have any uh, input, other lessons you think might be learned from this battle, please do let me know. I'm in Mississippi for the whole month of July. So if you have any other battlefields that you'd like me to check out, Shiloh's only a couple hours away, please let me know. And I will make my darndest to uh, try and go see him. So anyhow, I will see you in the next one. Stay tuned for Open Saturday tomorrow and for more videos from other on-location sites to analyze some Creekspiel moments.